Good evening. Can I just take this moment to thank you all for coming out, given I know that, as noted several times tonight, A, it's cold, and B, this was rescheduled. I'm really very grateful you, you are all here. So am I. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I can't start this evening here in the Skirball without giving brief mention to the loss of our dear friends who desired her this week. I'm sure she's known to many of you in the community. Didi and I happened to meet her and Marvin on our honeymoon in Italy when we were staying in the same farmhouse complex in Tuscany. And one night after dinner, they brought over a batch of mulberries and ice cream for dessert, and we were friends ever since. So may her memory be a blessing, as I know that it is. Um, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here with Maggie. For many reasons, we were colleagues at Politico. I'm not quite old enough to be her father, thankfully, but I'm definitely old enough to be her much older brother. And 40 years ago, when I was starting my career at the New York Times, her father was a star reporter on the Metro desk, and her mother was one of the leading, most important publicists in Manhattan. And she was allowed to talk to only one editor at the Metro desk, Anna Quinlan. So I feel really mishpuka with uh, Maggie here tonight and, and delighted, <laughs> delighted to be here. So Maggie, Donald Trump, uh, you write in the book that when Donald Trump won, our colleague Adam Nagurney of the New York Times told you this would be the story of a lifetime. Uh, our colleague Maureen Dowd told me the same thing, and I said, so was the Civil War, but I wouldn't want to have to cover it. Um, I don't mean this question to sound flip, but how do you stand it? Well, first of all, thank you for doing this tonight, Todd. Thank you to everyone at Skirball for making this happen. Um, I, yes, as I, I write, Adam messaged me and <clears throat> said that this was good for me personally, meaning career-wise. And I wrote back, you have no idea what's coming. Um, and I, I don't really know how to answer that because uh, there are, in some ways, this is, you know, there are aspects of this that are like any other political beat. You know, you, you covered New York, you have covered the White House, you have covered, you know, all manner of politics nationally. And there is a certain sameness to that, but obviously there are many aspects of this that are different. Um, I think what I found rewarding about being able to write this book was the ability to step back and look at it all and see what mattered and see what, what didn't um, over the course of the four years of the presidency and, and then both campaigns. Um, I think that we expended a lot of energy that we didn't necessarily have to on certain things. And yet so much of what was taking place was, you know, completely norm shattering, nothing we had seen before. Um, you know, there was, there was government corruption at a level that, you know, just was sort of out in the open with a, with a, a, a sitting president who wasn't divested from his company with a hotel down the street where, where people- foreign visitors were going to. Foreign visitors were going and, and, and you know, half the Republican party and half the lobbyists in DC. He was um, charging the secret service to use his own hotel. Yeah. To and so, you know, getting our arms around that, which was just taking place as if nothing was happening, at the same time that the work of the federal government was going on, that was something that I, I think was a challenge for all of us. I want to go back a bit because one of the things that's so clear in your book, you spend, I think, fully half the book on Donald Trump's years in, before the presidency in New York, and it seems to be that you think that's a really an essential part of understanding him. When I was working in New York uh, covering politics, Donald Trump was treated as a joke. He was a person you called for a funny quote or an outrageous statement. Um, I remember I got a page one story out of his uh, coming to get this wedding license with Marla Maples. Um, and that picture was, is in the book. <laughs> I saw that picture, but, and, and, but he was part of the whole passing parade of New York. Um, you've been spending serious time for 11 years looking at his political aspirations. And I just wonder, do you think one of the mistakes of the media, including the New York Times, which you weren't working for then, was that when Donald Trump first came in 2015 down that golden escalator, people didn't take him seriously enough as a political force? And have we, are we all paying the price for that? I think to some, I would say that uh, there's, there's two problems. So I agree with you that I think there were a number of people who treated him as a joke, and yet, even as a joke, he was still a page one story in the Times for getting a wedding license. Um, he knew how to get what he wanted in coverage because he didn't care that people, well, he did care, but um, he wasn't letting the fact that people weren't taking him seriously become an impediment to what he wanted to do. 
Um, and then there were people who, who did treat him seriously. There were a number of wives of wealthy men who really liked Ivana, and because of that, you know, were far more muted in their criticism of him than they might have been otherwise. And so, you know, he developed this friendship with Robert Morgenthau, the Manhattan district attorney, who, you know, whose calling card was, you know, sort of this sense of righteousness about the law. And yet, you know, he went down to Mar-a-Lago to spend time with Donald Trump. He let Donald Trump throw a fundraiser for him in 2005. It's not exactly like there weren't whiffs of corruption around Trump at that point. So I think there were a number of ways in which he was enabled over all of those years leading up until 2015. And then to your point, by the time 2015 rolled around, I think there was a presumption among those of us, certainly in much of the New York media and parts of the DC media, predicated partly on the fact that four years earlier he had spread this lie about Obama's birthplace, um, which vaulted him to the top of the polls, but ultimately he you know, saw enough downside with his overlords at The, at the Apprentice uh, that he dropped it and, and stayed on the television show. But we didn't understand that the five borough view of him, that view of him as a joke, was not how most of the country saw him. It just wasn't. And most of the country came to know him either from The Art of the Deal, which was 1987, or the show based basically on The Art of the Deal, The Apprentice, in which he sat in a high-backed leather chair and you know, said, you're fired, which are words that he hates saying to people. But it looked as if this was a real thing. And so, I think we didn't understand, A, that people really had made up their minds about him. They were fairly impervious to new information about him. And even much of that new information, they didn't care. The Access Hollywood tape, a lot of these people had listened to him say really gross things on Howard Stern's show for years. So, you know, I, I think there were a number of factors at play. Tell the story that you tell in the book about running into the voter, and I think it was Iowa, who, when you asked, you, you assumed that it, we're going to treat Trump as kind of a novelty, and what did this person say to you? So um, my, my realization that The Apprentice had had a huge impact on how people were viewing him was uh, in the final, the final days of the Iowa caucuses in 2016, which he did not win, but he came close. Um, Lion Ted won there, right? Lion Ted. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, yes, his, his nickname habit was very well developed by then. Um, but I was at a, an airport hangar rally he was doing in Dubuque, Iowa. And I was asking a very leading question of all these people in the crowd. There were tons of people there, which was basically, are you here because the spectacle is gonna end? You know, the show's gonna stop. Is this one of your last times to see him? And one after another, people told me that they were gonna caucus for him, including one guy who looked at me like I had eight heads. And when I asked him why he was gonna do this, he said, I watched him run his business. And he meant The Apprentice. And that was a light bulb moment for me. I want to come back to the point you made about Robert Morgenthau in a minute, the Manhattan District Attorney, but um, you've said in many of the appearances I've seen you on, uh, and congrats on the enormous success, and well-deserved success of the book, uh, that it's a character study. So if that's the case, what is the essence of Donald Trump's character? What, what should we most take away? Um, this is a strange way to put it, I guess, but uh, there is both less and more there. Um, he cares primarily about money and dominance and power and himself. Um, he is not a strategic thinker, which I think any of you who followed the White House years are fairly familiar with. Uh, but he is calculating moment to moment. And he is often working on some plan in his head with rules that only make sense to him. But he will, you know, he, there's, there's very little that he truly believes in or would stand by. You know, he has these id-like impulses on things like trade or on, you know, the, the, the global order post-World War II. Uh, but he's willing to sublimate, you know, most or all of them if there's some other thing he can get from, you know, that he's looking for. So I think that the, the there is a, an ongoing desire to apply a, a rational frame to his behavior. And it just... He, he doesn't think or behave like almost anyone else you have ever met. So, so given that, let me ask another way. What is it that Trump sensed, anticipated, exploited in the public in terms of neediness or desire or resentment or anger or susceptibility? What did he tap into 
that so many of us in the mainstream media who were watching him in those early days probably missed. So I, I think there was an aspect of it that I think we didn't realize how firmly it had taken hold, and that was the, the Tea Party anger. I mean, he really came, and 2015 was, was after the, the main years of the Tea Party, but there was still this sort of bubbling anger in the GOP electorate, an electorate that, you know, disliked John McCain, that disliked Mitt Romney, and yet was angry at the media, even though they disliked Mitt Romney, they thought the media was mean to Mitt Romney. Um, I think that we missed uh, how willing people were to sublimate their own past stated impulses to vote for someone who would quote unquote fight. And what I think of when I say that is a story I worked on, and I write about this in the book, with one of my colleagues, Tom Kaplan, um, where we called self-identified evangelical voters who had said in, in our poll, in our survey, that they were voting for Trump. And this was, I think it was March or April of 2016, I might have the month wrong, but one after the other, they said, you know, I don't care, he fights, my, my insurance premiums are too high, uh, you know, I, I don't like the way the Obama administration has behaved. One guy told us that his pers Trump's personal life is saint-like compared to Bill Clinton. And this was, the, this was the kind of feedback that we were getting. And I think from the Trump- That from an evangelical. It, from evangelicals and self-described evangelicals. And, and so, you know, I think that what we missed was how, in addition to how branded Trump already was, you know, he, he, he really feeds on anger and he's really good at understanding the darkness of human emotions. This is not gonna be an uplifting night, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, but he really does feed on the darkness of human emotions. And, um, and he's excellent at, at knowing how being negative and, 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 and dark and you know, describing sort of this hellscape uh, of a country, as he was putting it, um, how that would appeal to people. He's really good at that. When the Tea Party arose in the anger of 2009 and 2010 in response to President Obama's ascendancy and Obamacare and the rest of it, the Republican leadership in Congress, in the person of John Boehner among others, thought they could ride this tiger. They could take the anger, they could take the weight, but they could tame it and bring it to the uh, benefit of establishmentarian uses. Obviously, they all were racked up on the shoals of that proposition, they, they lost. Kevin McCarthy, if he becomes the Speaker of the House next year, will presumably face some of the same problems if he, if he even becomes the Speaker. But did Trump understand somehow, he understood that th that power was not something to ride, it was something that would ride you, and that he, he, he seemed to have a, a, a better understanding of what that anger was really about than the traditional Republicans who thought they, they, they figured it out. He did, although it's not because he was basing it on, you know, learned studies of... Or polling. Or yeah, or polling. I mean, you know, there, he, certainly, he certainly looked at polling. Um, he watched a lot of Fox News, and a lot of that was playing out there. And his ability to take what he sees and hears on television and skim it for ideas that he then repackages at his own really can't be overstated. And so he had, you know, Sean Hannity in his ear. Um, you know, he had Janine Pirro, his friend on Fox News. He, he organically had people in place who could be in his ear on these fronts, you know, except there's no through line. One of the, one of the things that I mentioned in the book is that after, um, uh, after Romney lost, and remember right before he lost, that 47% tape came out where he was talking about 47% of the country as takers, essentially. Um, and Trump said to someone, you know, why would you insult half the country? And it was just, well, I mean, we've seen him insult half the country. Um, uh, two-thirds uh, of the country. Two-thirds of the country. Um, and yet, you know, he sees that as somehow different from what he's doing. And so I agree with you that I think that he found a way to ride it, and I think that he found a way to, to whip it into a frenzy, but I think he stumbled into that as much as anything. In uh, one of your post-presidency presidency interviews that you did for the book, Trump refers to you jocularly, but as his psychiatrist. So Dr. Heberman, putting him on the couch for a minute, what is the source in your view of, of Trump's enormous reservoirs of anger, resentment, uh, the things that seem to drive him so much, almost as 
feral forces. No, I, feral is a great word for them. Um, and I should just note that, as I say in the book, it was a completely meaningless line to call me his psychiatrist. It was meant to flatter um, and is the kind of thing he says about a lot of people and things or his Twitter feed. But I think that, he, you know, a lot of this stuff is pretty simple. I mean, I think some of this is just who he is. I mean, I write in the book about, you know, him at five years old throwing rocks at a baby in a crib. Um, so that's, that's not something a lot of children I've known have done. Um, you know, and they've done, they've engaged in pranks, but not like that. I think he had a, a really, really tough father. Um, Ivana Trump described him in her words as brutal. Uh, I think he had a father who bragged about him to others and was undermining in private and cold and distant. And I think that, um, you know, Trump admired him but also really resented him and feared him. And I think that's the, that's the main force in terms of the anger. In terms of the sort of not being given your respect thing, and the grievance, there's just a, a chronic insecurity. I mean, you know, one of the things that has always struck me about him is he sloughs off media coverage that would flatten other politicians. I mean, there's stuff that gets written about him that he just doesn't even register. The stuff that he does register, and I write about this in the book, uh, are things like seeing me on television on Charlie Rose's show, which he only was watching because he was flipping the commercials during Lou Dobbs, and yes, I do know that to be true, um, seeing me say that he watches a lot of television. This was in 2017, which he only knows because he saw me say it on television. But he got very angry and was complaining about it for days to his aides. And it's because he sees that as some kind of a knock on his intelligence. That he and can't read, he has to watch television. That he has to watch television, that he's just not that smart. And, you know, this is somebody who, you know, we've never seen his transcripts, but we know from things his sister has said, uh, Marianne, you know, that he, he had trouble getting, where he got into college was Fordham University, and, you know, uh, there's been all sorts of discussions about other, other kids taking tests for him, and so I think that's a huge source of insecurity for him. Where he gets offended is when, it's, when people suggest he's not that rich. I mean, it's all this perception thing, and I just think it all comes from insecurity. What about his notable lack of kind of milk of human kindness? I mean, his mother was very ill in his early childhood. Some people have speculated that he didn't have the normal, appropriate bonding with a mother figure. Uh, again, we're, we're in a Jewish cultural center, so I have to ask. Uh, <laughs> what, what, was, there, was there anything, do you put any stock in that theory, that he, he was deprived of love at a crucial point? There's, I think he was deprived of love at many points, I think not just that moment when his mother was sick, but by all accounts, his mother was not a dominant force in that household over the years, and it was a household that was really run by Fred, and Fred was not warm or loving. Fred was, you know, in, in addition to however, you know, literally tough he could be, he just was brusque and a man of few words and not prone to hugs. I just, I think Wayne Barrett, who um, was the Village Voice muckraker and, and the first Trump biographer and, and in whose footsteps we all follow. But Wayne had a, a line actually in a piece at Politico in 2016 about how, you know, there's basically a, a love-sized hole missing in, in Donald Trump. And I think that's right. A colleague of ours once said that uh, she thought that Maureen Dowd had such a unique perspective on the Bush family because she viewed them the way an Irish maid in the downstairs of Kenny Bunkport would have seen the family. And, and President Bush the first clearly both couldn't stop talking to her and regretted sort of every time he did. You have a similar kind of uh, symbiotic uh, relationship with Trump who keeps talking to you despite enormously critical coverage that you do. Um, do you think part of your experience and expertise in covering him comes from your, your New Yorkness, the fact that you grew up in New York in the tabloid world of New York, that you, you worked for the Daily News, you worked for the Post, you worked for the Times, that you know that in your bones, sort of, and you know kind of what triggers him in a way? I think he has an intense fascination with the New York Times, and I'm just the person who covers him most often from the New York Times. I think the fact that I knew him before he was a, a candidate and the fact that I worked in the tabloids uh, probably adds to a note of familiarity, and he tends to gravitate toward the familiar. He's an incredibly provincial guy. Uh, and so I think there is something to that, but I, I really, I don't think I can overstate how obsessed he is with the New York Times. Um, I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of how journalism works, 
but there is a strain of criticism of you from the left that you somehow, because you write about him so much and you have access to him and his circle and that you chronicle his comings and goings, that you somehow enable him. Um, to me, personally, it seems you do exactly the opposite. You, you reveal him. But I'm sure you're familiar with that kind of strain of, well, what do you make of that and what, what do you say to those people who, who say, how dare you even waste our time writing about him so much? Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with, the, with the, the line of criticism. Um, you know, I should note that I haven't talked to him uh, since I reported much earlier this year, and it was reporting for the book, but I made it public in February, that he had been flushing documents down the toilet, which was not a story he liked. Um, and, uh, and, and but, but it was, you know, I thought important, and I, you know, I understand a lot of people heard it as, you know, ha-ha toilet, we're, we were talking about presidential records, and so, um, you know, there's a, there's a larger story at play. Um, I don't see how you ignore a president. I, I, I don't think that, you know, I think he was a nominee and then he was a president, and I think that he has actually appropriately been covered far less over the course of the last 18 months. Um, and when he is covered, I think that he is contextualized, as he should be, as somebody who is under investigations, who continues to tell lies about the 2020 election, and who continues to encourage, you know, most candidates running in his party to do the same thing. So, but I don't, I don't, he doesn't exist because we write about him. You know, he, we are covering what's happening. And, you know, um, writing about something and describing something is not endorsing something. And I think there's just a, a lack of understanding of, of how this works and what it means. I would, I would put some of the fault on this, Todd, in terms of what people misunderstand about reporting on Twitter. Um, a lot of people are getting their understanding of news, and they're, in, they're not only getting their information from Twitter, they're getting their understanding of journalism from Twitter. There's a lot of misinformation about journalism on Twitter. This is an old dilemma for reporters who write books, especially political books in real time, but um, your, your book is full of fascinating you know, news-making nuggets. I don't know if you can see in the light here, but I, I really did read every page. Um, but I think there's also been a criticism of you, again, personally I think it's unfair, that you held things back for the book. Could you explain a little bit about the ways in which people in the world of Washington in particular, it's an odd phenomenon, but they're often willing to talk for what they consider to be history instead of the first rough draft of history of the daily paper. Uh, just talk a little bit about how that works. And, and did you feel that you were suppressing things that you only told us in the book that you should have told us in the New York Times? Sure. So the, the answer to that one, categorically no. Um, the, uh, and I know that a lot of people, um, you know, have questions about this, not just with my book, with, but with, I think, any book, to your point, um, as events are unfolding. Books are, are just fundamentally different. A, books are journalism. So for, I think, part of the thing that people don't understand, to your point, is that people do feel like they're talking for history. Um, books aren't some whole other endeavor. Uh, they're very related um, to, the, to the work that journalists do. But they take time, and it's a different process, and it's going back to sources and interviewing them again about events and, and generally getting much more information than we got in real time. Um, you know, my goal is always to get confirmable reportable information out to the public as, as quickly as possible, um, but it takes time to confirm things, and it takes time to, to dig reporting out. The book is full of fascinating nuggets. I mean, you know, that's why I have all those little tabs there. Um, some of these, I think, had been in the paper, some had not. That, that his focus on building the wall was a mnemonic device his aide suggested to try to get him to remember to bring up immigration as a talking point, right? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that was really interesting to me was that uh, I report about the work that he did in 2011 when he was thinking about running for president. And can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm a very low talker and I'm very aware of it right now. Um, when he was talking to different consultants, he had a meeting with uh, two Republican uh, pollsters, brothers, John and Jim McLaughlin. And, you know, he was going through his, you know, his, his itemized list of what he cared about, and immigration didn't come up. So this is 2011. 
By 2014, immigration had become a big issue in the midterms that year. And so the following year, uh, as uh, Sam Nunberg and Roger Stone are prepping Trump to run, they push him on this idea of talk about a wall. Actually, it was before 2015. Talk about a wall, because Trump couldn't focus on the topic. And he it was not just, it wasn't natural to him to bring it up. So he started bringing up the wall. And he later- Because it was concrete and it could be built. And, and, it, yeah, it's like, a, and he's, you know, he tends to, and I, you know, I wrote about this in the book. Even through the, throughout the presidency, the projects that interested him most were construction projects. You know, it was, it was, it was the new FBI headquarters. It was, you know, the new Air Force One. It was, uh, it was the wall. But you know, these were the kinds of things that, and it was, you know, moving the embassy was something that he could visualize more in Jerusalem. Um, in Jerusalem, uh, and so from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and so. Uh, the wall was an easy one for him, and then he discovered, and he, t he actually talked about this at a New York Times editorial board meeting uh, in either late 2015 or early 2016, that when he could see the crowd was getting bored, he would just say, and we're going to build the wall, and they'd get all excited. And so it was, you know, it was not organic to him. It was suggested to him. You also have all kinds of wonderful details about the tearing up the paper down the toilet, the fact that there's a plastic surgeon in the White House medical office. Uh, you have a little meditation on Rudy Giuliani's uh, bathroom habits, airborne, and Trump's uh, distaste for them. It's a very well, little. It's a very little. Well, why, like why do people tell you this stuff? <laughs> I mean, apart from your skill and charm and diligence, and you know, <laughs> they can't help themselves. I mean, like, I just look like I want to hear it. I guess. No, I, I don't. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it, it depends on, on what we're talking about. The Giuliani one came up organically in a conversation where somebody just started talking about it. Um, the, the paper down the toilet was again a part of, I first stumbled on it and it was after he had left the White House as part of a, a different conversation. Um, and I, I can't get more deeply into it just because no, no, it gets to no, sourcing, no. but um, it wasn't like I was calling people saying, did he flush stuff? It was like it, it came up and, and this person sort of... Organically. Yeah. Right, organically. And yeah. I was like, wait, what? And that took, it took a while to confirm. Um, and so, you know, I think that people in that White House, I know people in that White House, you know, some people talk because they want to harm some other person, right? They, they tell stories about a rival aide, or, and that's been time immemorial. That's not just this White House. It just was more intense in this White House. A lot of people talked because they were deeply troubled uh, by day-to-day -day behavior by the president. Um, you know, they talked because they needed help processing what they were seeing. I remember one, one White House official texting me in 20, early 2017, very late at night, saying, a lot of people in this White House don't really understand the law. I thought, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and, you know, this was about the president and his, you know, immediate, immediate advisors and family. Um, but people were seeing something they had never seen before, and processing it, you know, was a, a, a long ordeal. Just as practice, that made me think of something. How do people, how do your sources mostly communicate with you these days? Text, email, phone, person, a meeting in the corner of 33rd and 3rd? I mean, <laughs> you know. um, all of the above, um, but, uh, uh, but generally speaking, it's, it's over some encrypted app. Everybody's careful about that. Careful on that, yeah. To come back to the issue, uh, whenever you guys, Andrea or whatever, want to bring questions up, just, just remind me that, um, w to the issue of press criticism more broadly, you write in the book that the press was woefully unprepared for dealing with a politician, and not just a politician, but a president of the United States who was willing to lie so freely. And the New York Times went through a big internal process, I know, to actually decide to use the word lie. Um, how do you think the press has done in general in covering Donald Trump? Has it really yet figured out how to cover him, and are there lessons it needs to learn if he runs again um, next year? Well, I think he is going to run again, and I think it will begin this year, not next year. And so I think the press is very low on time to figure it out. Um, but I, I think there's, um, I think there are things the press has gotten a lot better about. I think that, you know, I mentioned context earlier and contextualizing him. I think that, generally speaking, the media across the board is better at, you know, 
pointing out that this is a potential likely candidate who's under multiple investigations uh, at, at a state and federal level in, in two different states and two different DOJ investigations. Um, I think that pointing out that he is saying things that are flatly untrue about the election gets pointed out a lot. I think his full-on embrace of the QAnon conspiracy theory gets written about in ways that I think people had trouble looking straight at for a long time when he but was president. But he's now made it so overt. But he's now made it so overt that it's you know pretty easy to write about. But I think, Todd, this is going to be, I think, a day-to-day -day process for all media um, for the foreseeable future because he tends to test the system, all of these systems, uh, in ways we haven't seen before. And I think this will be no different. I think he's going to... Look, I don't expect he's going to be on conservative media the way he was, at least right away, and there's a simple reason for that. Which you mean is, in the same uncritical way that he was before, sort of? Yeah, like, and, and whenever he wanted, right? Okay. I mean, he's barely on Fox these days. And Whereas it, before, he was on CNN and Fox and everything. Yeah, that, uh, you know. but even, I mean, he hasn't been on CNN forever, but he was, he was on Fox, you know, throughout his presidency when he wanted to be. Um, since 2020, that really hasn't happened, and I think it's a combination of, you know, I've written about this, others have written about this, that you know, Rupert Murdoch has sort of had his fill of some of this. But Fox and Newsmax and you know, a bunch of folks got sued uh, by election companies for defamation for the things that they were putting on their air about the election. And there is a potential risk to having him on air. And I don't know what that's gonna look like when he is, uh, when he is a, a candidate, which again, I assume he is going to be. Um, but I think we're going to be dealing with a day-by-day -day basis how he gets covered, and I think there's going to be plenty of times where there are stories that just say, Donald Trump said, and there probably shouldn't be. I hate these kind of questions, but they're the questions people ask me, so I'll ask you. Thanks. Can, can he win again? Yeah, and I think anyone who tells... I, I don't think that's a bad question, Todd. I think it's actually something people need to really think about. I, uh, a couple of people have said to me, including people who you know, were until recently very close to him, he'll never win another national election. I just don't know how you say that at this point. I think that we have seen that, um, you know, the imp Democrats, I think, have haltingly, I don't think it has been uniformly or across the board, tried to point to the midterms next week as vital in terms of democracy. Um, and... January 6th has been a huge focus of the press most of this year, and certainly most of last year, and it is n nowhere near the top issue that most voters are thinking about. And if they are, they've probably made up their minds already that they're not voting for a Republican. Um, I think that Trump's ability to get himself out of certain situations is unlike anything I've ever seen, and I think we have seen that the electorate's tolerance for transgressive behavior is a lot bigger than many of us thought it was. So, so yes. I think it's become somewhat reflexive to say that Trump is a symptom of the state of our politics more than a cause, but at the same time, it does seem fair to say that he's unleashed certain forces or made it possible to say things out loud that people weren't allowed to sort of privately think for the last 50 years. What are, the, what are the political forces that you think Trump has unleashed, and is the Republican Party going to be able to, in any way, control those forces going forward? It's a really good question. Um, <coughs> you know, I think, that, and I agree with you, that I think he is both a symptom and a cause. Um, what I think he has, ex you know, grabbed onto and fueled and then benefited from is this incredible sense of mistrust that now exists across the country. It's not just across politics. It's across everything. Um, and, you know, we are seeing overt anti-Semitism. We are, it's, it's, you know, Trump posted a, a post on his social media website, Truth Social, a couple of Sundays, a, a late Sunday morning post about how U.S. Jews need to get their act together. It was, get, get their act together was the quote. And what he meant was support him the way Israeli Jews do for actions he's taken related to Israel. It's pretty astonishing, and um, and it was basically a moment, another moment, where most Republicans, you know, with their eyes on the midterms, averted their gaze and said nothing. Um, you know, I think that he has unleashed, uh, or at least made permissible, a fair amount of overt racism. There are these ads that are airing, run by a group, 
connected to Stephen Miller, Trump's former policy advisor and current advisor. Graduate of Santa Monica High. That's a good point. Um, who, you know, that complain about anti-white racism. These ads are running in Georgia, where the two Senate candidates are both black men. Um, that is not something that I think would have been mainstreamed, uh, you know, until recently. And I don't know how that genie gets put back in the bottle. One of the wo wonderful granular stories you tell in the book that I hadn't been aware of is, you mentioned earlier, Robert Morgenthau, the longtime Manhattan District Attorney, United States Attorney before that, son of Franklin Roosevelt's Treasury Secretary, uh, close aide to Robert Kennedy, um, really never looked into Donald Trump's business dealings. And Donald Trump took great pains to contribute to uh, Mr. Morgenthau's favorite charity, the Police Athletic League. Talk a little bit about that sort of favor bank of New York and in ways that people might not have realized. Sure. So I mean, one of the things that I try to show in the book, and to your, your point earlier about how important I consider those years in New York to be, to who he is and, and how he, what he exported to Washington, you know, the New York that he came up in was rife with corruption in the construction industry. The concrete industry was incredibly mobbed up. Um, the political system was still dominated by machine politics, which was a, a Tammany Hall derivative. Um, you know, aspects of the media were completely transactional. And, you know, that is that favor economy that you're talking about. Morgenthau was a former federal prosecutor um, uh, and a, and a very known name in democratic politics. And in the 1980s, Trump decided it was prudent to strike up a friendship with him. And some of it is that Morgenthau was part of the elite power structure that Trump badly wanted to be part of. But some of it was that, you know, Trump thought that having, you know, friends who were prosecutors was worthwhile. And it's a, a lifetime of Trump donating to and ingratiating himself with elected officials and prosecutors. And Morgenthau was open to it. You know, Morgenthau would joke with people that the Police Athletic League was the only charity that Trump met his commitment to. Um, you know, and he, he liked Trump. So, uh, you know, I don't think that, um, I don't know if there was ever anything specific that crossed Morgenthau's desk. I talked to somebody, uh, you know, who, who knew what took place during some of those years in that office uh, had been, and this person said that the only thing that they had ever gotten word of was Trump stiffing contractors, you know, contra contractors being complained about stiffed, which was not new uh, for Trump to do, and their, their attitude was, we're not a collection agency. And that's fine, but there were so many other red flags around Trump yeah. that he, they probably could have looked could if have they wanted looking, to. Presumably. Yeah. I think many people understand that uh, one of Donald Trump's important role models was Roy Cohn, the, the lawyer for uh, Senator McCarthy, and, and who became a fixer lawyer in Manhattan in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. Uh, less well understood is his admiration for the Brooklyn Democratic leader, Meade Esposito. Uh, talk a little bit about that world of Brooklyn politics where his father operated and, and what Donald Trump learned from Meade. Um. <clears throat> So after Trump's first year in, in office, and I wrote about this in 2017, um, Trump kept talking about this, you know, figure in Brooklyn who he kept describing them as waving a baseball bat, but it was a cane that he was talking about. And Meet Esposito was this deeply corrupt, deeply powerful Brooklyn machine Democratic Party leader who made judges and made district attorneys and uh, he, you know, and, and blessed real estate projects in his fiefdom. And this model of top-down, quote-unquote, leadership is, you know, what Trump thought being in power looked like. Um, and he spoke, you know, lovingly about Meet Esposito when I asked him about him in this who, interview. Who kept a baseball bat in his desk. It was actually a, it was a cane. Okay. Um, and, he would, and, and he would swing it at people, <coughs> according to Trump. Um, but Trump said to me, you know, Meade ruled with an iron fist. And it's the same language that he uses about Xi Jinping, rules with an iron fist. And, you know, so much of violence relates so much to what Trump thinks uh, comprises strength. And that in turn informs what he thinks makes a strong leader or a good boss. And Meade was a classic example of that, although it's funny, I asked him in one of our interviews, 
did you think that that's what being president was going to be like? And I know the answer is yes, but he's strange, because he has said this to other people, but he strangely said, well, I really thought Mitch McConnell was going to be more like that and keep people in line for me. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but McConnell did keep people in line for him. You know, he kept him from being convicted in the Senate impeachment trial. Twice. Um, yeah. I don't know. He didn't keep him the second time, but he didn't vote for it. Yeah. And, that, and that had an impact. Um, you know, he helped usher through legislation. He helped push through justices. Um, you know, he, he basically was openly telling me he thought every system would be, would be top down and, you know, and run, ruled with an iron fist. Harry Truman famously supposedly said when he contemplated the idea of General Eisenhower becoming president, he said, poor Ike, he'll sit there and give orders and think it'll happen right away and it won't be a bit like the army. And in a way, I guess Trump found out that it wasn't at all like. That's right. Our audience has sent some really good questions and so I, I have plenty of questions to ask you but I want to uh, give them a chance as well. Yvonne asks, do you have PTSD after the amount of time you've spent with Trump? <laughs> Um, no, but, um, but I, I did find writing the book to be pretty dark. Um, I, I had not, as long as I've covered him, I had never delved quite that deeply into aspects of him. And it wasn't like, you know, you found this nice, nice story of him, you know, giving someone a pony just because, or, you know, it was, it was, it was, there was a lot of darkness around it. Um, and I, I found that hard. Did you have any antidote? Did you have uh, hot chocolate, babka? I mean, what, what did you use to like? Um, I, yeah, my, my antidote is writing daily stories for the newspaper, so that was what I would, I would plug back into. This is another interesting question, actually, about the pony. Is Trump loved by his family? That's an excellent question. Um, so the answer is, is, is at least by his, his children, the answer is yes. Um, you know, in the same way that he loved his father. Um, but they, at least two of them are completely, you know, Ivanka Trump married into a very wealthy family. So she has a very different life. Um, his sons are much more dependent on him. And that's just a very different uh, circumstance. Um, but they do, they do all love him, um, but it's obviously complicated. Uh, did Trump ever actually do any governing, any real work? It's a good question, but, but the answer is yes, he did. Um, you know, he, there were certainly days, one, one former official said to me, there were days where we basically didn't have a president. And I think that it, that felt true to a lot of people who worked in the White House. I, I write about how, you know, he would engage in all kinds of activities that just seemed to be passing the time, including making aides sit with him for over an hour and a half, going through the Who's Tommy soundtrack, searching on Spotify, searching for a song he insisted existed, and it did not, because he wanted to play this at his rally. Uh, he just had it in his mind that it was there. He thought it was there, wasn't there. They all sat, you know, probably around five o'clock or so in the Oval Office for an hour and a half. Um, but, you know, but he did do real work, and he did, you know, he... He took the briefings uh, a couple of times a week. He was not especially focused during them. He was often doing other things during them, signing things and things like that. Um, and they had to be pretty tailored to him because he doesn't, he wouldn't read the briefing book. Um, so there are a lot of pictures. And a lot of pictures and graphics and, and they tried to keep things to two pages. Um, but he, you know, he, he did do work, but he is, you know, he was notorious for not being a hard worker. His, his longtime friends said it to me years ago. Well, President Reagan famously said at the Gridiron Dinner one year, they say hard work never hurt anybody, but I figure why take a chance, so. Uh, <laughs> right, he's not, he's not the first president in history to not exactly be, you know, nose to the grindstone, but his just presented a little differently. There's a famous story about Williamsburg Economic G7 Summit and President Reagan hadn't read the briefing book and Jim Baker, who was the chief of staff, came and saw that it was untouched. He said, Mr. President, the summit's beginning. You didn't read the briefing book. Well, Jim, the sound of music was on television last night and we'd never seen it. Um, this, is, this, is pretty, this is pretty pretty similar. Um, here's another insightful question. Uh, uh, per your reporting and observation, do any of Donald Trump's children have a similar set of political skills? That's also a really good question. Um, the answer is no, 
Um, uh, but if if one of them were to, you know, I think Ivanka Trump has fantasies of being recruited to run for some office. I have a very hard time seeing it because I can't see her withstanding the media coverage unless it was a... Or the a, back and forth of it all. Yeah, <laughs> or unless it was a race that was just totally teed up for her. Um, Don Jr. actually speaks the language of the what is now the Republican base a lot more organically than his father did. Um, and, and it was like that for a long time. Uh, and he's the only one who I could see maybe running for office, but I'm, I'm not positive. You've spent at least, I, by my count, 11 years thinking pretty seriously about the political side of Donald Trump. What surprised you the most, if anything, as you researched the book? Was there anything that really made you sit up and say howdy? I mean, flushing documents was up there. That I, uh, there were, so I write in the book, um, and this actually hasn't gotten as much attention as some other stuff, and I've been a little surprised by it, and I think it sort of speaks to that whole hard to look right at it thing uh, that I mentioned before. Um, he had this girlfriend in the late 1990s after he had separated from Marla, and at, at one point he was dating, I think, both this woman, Kara Young, who was a, a biracial supermodel, and Melania Knauss at the same time. Um, this is before he was married to Melania. And he could be, you know, he seemed genuinely infatuated with, with Kara Young, according to a ton of people who knew him at the time, but he also was clearly enjoying the, the game of, you know, who should I choose? And he would do things, and this surprised me, um, you know, he, when her mother was sick, he helped arrange her care, which is sort of more standard. But there was this one anecdote where she's having trouble getting a car service to take her with her young son to the airport, and she calls Trump to see if he can help her get a car, and he drives his own limo down to pick her up and wears the limousine with, like, the chauffeur's cap oh. uh, wow. and drives it down himself. That surprised me a little bit. But was, she, was she having trouble because she was biracial and a cab driver wouldn't stop her? No, she, she was just having trouble getting a car service. It. But But the flip side of that is, you know, he meets her parents, and her mother is black and her father is white, and he says to her, you know, uh, a couple weeks later that she got her beauty from her mom and her brains from her dad, the white side. And, you know, she told him he shouldn't joke about things like that. So it's, you know, there's never just sort of the one side. It's always, it always comes with something. Now that the book is written, and let's just also say a big bestseller, are you going to keep covering Trump or change assignments? What would you like to do moving forward? And what the New York Times will have you do is a different question. Right. I, um, I just uh, want to get a little sleep. But I, um, I think that uh, I, I, will, I will cover Trump in some form or another as long as he is a political story, I suspect. But, but I do have bosses who make those decisions. Do you think, this is an interesting question too, it's something I've wondered about. Uh, you you're, say that Trump will run again. Do, do you think he's worried about losing though? I mean, uh, losing twice or once in the case maybe, but I mean. Anything. He said the election that he lost was stolen and rigged, and he said the election he won was rigged. So I don't think he's gonna have any problem saying the same thing if he loses again. Do you think there's a lot of uh, the earnest-minded, civic-minded people think that there'll somehow be, Liz Cheney suggested that you know there should be a, a new party, a third party, the Republican Party will dissolve and something should rise from its ashes. Do you think they're, they're, the Republican Party can continue as a wholly owned subsidiary of Trump or will there be um, an impulse to do something different? I don't think there's gonna be an impulse to do anything different anytime soon. I mean, I, you know, it would have to come from very loud voices in the form of Mitch McConnell or, you know, people who are still firmly entrenched in the party, um, you know, and not seen as never Trumpers, you know, McConnell has real cred on working with Trump over a very long period of time and sublimating his own clear disgust with Trump. Um, but I don't think that there's any market for that right now. I mean, this is the problem is this is a market issue, right? And they're, he's just doing what the market will tolerate. I mean, this is a, question that goes to the same question. Why are so many Republicans following Trump despite his treatment of them and, and the problems he's caused them uh, in other ways? Because he can whip his voters into a frenzy and, and they will lose their jobs and 
one of the things I write about is that he proved over four years, and I'd say at this point now six, that Republicans who he repeatedly criticized in the 2016 campaign were and are just as craven as he said they, they are. Um, you know, they're completely willing to be subservient to him to preserve themselves. And it's just that simple. You know, all of these primary fields in these various races, almost all of them were various shades of Trump. And, you know, it, it's not like there was some anti-Trump candidate who was gonna win in most of these races. I would say Brian Kemp was frankly the strongest version, but Kemp was still running on a lot of things that, that Trump was successful with. This is, a, this is a powerful question given where we're sitting tonight also. The notes that Trump has openly, you know, acknowledged reading Mein Kampf and had admired dictators from North Korea to China. Is his goal really ultimately to turn the United States into some kind of authoritarian regime and, and be, become president for life? So I'm going to correct something, and, and it's important, and you'll see why. He hasn't acknowledged reading Mein Kampf. He, he had a book of Hitler's speeches um, on his important bedside too. table, you know, it's very important. But it, the reason that I'm making the point is I'm not actually sure how much of it he read. It was gifted to him by a friend, but it, you know, whatever. He you know, happily kept that next to his bedside um, and you know, told, told John Kelly in the White House that Hitler did some good things. So, and he said, Where, why can't I have generals like Hitler's generals? Yeah, except the problem with that historically is that Hitler's generals tried to kill Hitler. So it also, so, Which he did not know. Right, and so I guess the, the, what I go, my point in, in, in pointing that out is that I don't think, and I, I've said this at various points over the last couple of weeks, and I've gotten some pushback for it, but he has strongman impulses, um, and he often behaves like a strong, a strong man or a bossist. He's not a true authoritarian in the sense that there's no, you know, through line. He, for instance, he didn't take the COVID crisis to try to centralize his power. He just couldn't figure out what to do and, and instead just retreated to feeling sorry for himself. And in some ways, that's more dangerous because this goes back to my point at the beginning, which is that, you know, he doesn't really believe in anything which means that he believes in himself. And if you're willing to present him with something that's good for him, he'll tend to jump at it. Um, I don't think he has an authoritarian plan. I think he has a plan for revenge and spite if he wins again. Do you think, though, that he would be more dangerous in a second term because he knows where the light switches are and knows how the levers of power work and could staff his agencies with people who would be utterly loyal to him instead of stand back? Those are two separate questions. I think he would absolutely staff his agencies with people who are loyal to him or try to, although in many cases he will still have to get Senate confirm confirmation on these appointees. And unless there is a large Senate majority, that's going to be tough with some of them. Um, but I don't think that he knows where the lights are, where, how the levers of power work. I think he's never figured that out. I write in the book, I mean, so two things to that. I write in the book about how, this is now 2019, he, he has no idea who his head of the Office of Legislative Affairs is. And so he, in a meeting, he tells one aide who doesn't handle ledge affairs, I'm taking this away from you and I'm giving it to this other guy. And there's like, okay. And they leave the meeting and, you know, they, they're not really sure what to do, and they decide to just ignore it and move on, and they move on, and he never says anything about it. He had no use for his cabinet members. He had no idea what most of them did. And so to that point, you know, it, in a lot of ways, I think that what happened on January 6th was a strange, um, and I'll have to amend this a little bit, given what we know the Secret Service was told from the House Select Committee, but um, it was in many ways a, a failure of imagination in the sense that so much of official Washington was focused on the idea that he was gonna give an illegal order to the military and send them to the Capitol. Instead and of a, instead of, a he was, ragtag force of. Yeah, because he doesn't, he had no idea what would happen if he did that, uh, you know? And he, he, he generally tries, you know, he's very indecisive and he, there are certain hot stoves he won't touch because he's not sure how it's gonna end. So it was always likelier that it was going to be some group of people where he would say, what? I said peacefully and patriotically. I didn't tell them to go do that. I just said, you know, march. That was always the likelier scenario, which is him giving some coded statement, but not something where he has full ownership or authority. He presumably, though, he might have been surprised by what happened, but he wasn't disappointed, right? He was certain, uh, there, there, by, by all my reporting and by the House Select Committee's information, he was not disappointed. 
This is a near universal question when it comes to President Trump, but um, so uh, if you had the answer, you could probably make a million dollars. But does Vladimir Putin have compromise, compromising information on Donald I, I Trump? I don't know how to begin to answer that. I, I don't know, and, and if I knew the answer to that, it would have been in the New York Times. But I, um, I don't, um, I think he, he clearly, you know, has been willing to say a number of admiring things about Putin, including calling him smart for beginning the war in Ukraine initially before he reversed course and tried to claim he had said something otherwise. You know, and, and his own staff in the White House spent years speculating why it was that he would do this. In your own mind, have you had it even any tentative working, tentative working theory except his admiration for strong men? And his admiration for strong men and decades-long interest in doing business in Russia are the only things that I can point to. Did you like writing the book? Did you like the process of it, despite the fact that it was often, I'm sure you were trying to, you were on leave for a little while, right? But you mostly were. Working through, yeah. yeah. Um, this was not the easiest thing I ever did. Um, it's lonely. It's, yeah, it's, and it's just, it's just really different. It's really different than you write a news story, you start again the next day. And uh, one of the things that I actually, and I mentioned this in the book that was sort of interesting going back and looking at all the old clips about Trump from the 80s and the 90s is just seeing how news process benefited him because most of those stories didn't mention, you know, it was like all his sins were washed away each day because it was just a new start. And that is sort of how, how news writing works. Um, it's, a, it's a lonely process and like I said, there was a darkness, but I'm, I'm very, very happy I did it. Um, the one thing about news stories and the inverted pyramid style that is used, I mean, nobody would tell a story sitting around the dinner table, three travelers bound for the Emerald City were stopped by a wicked witch today. I mean, it would be like a long time ago I was walking down the yellow brick road. So was that kind of fun to have the chance to, to step back and tell the story in a, in a way that you would really tell a story? Yeah, it was, it was really different, and that's exactly what it was like. Um, it, was, it was narrating but also reporting, and that was, a, I felt, a real a real privilege and gift to be able to do. How many bylines do you have on the website right now and how many in the paper tomorrow? <laughs> this feels like a lightning round. Um, I have one byline on the website today. Um, I don't think I have a story in the paper tomorrow. I had one yesterday. You had at one point in a single year more, than, more bylines than there were days in the year, right? Yes. And that's not, I mean, I can tell you from 23 years experience at the New York Times, that's not a very common thing. Internet has changed it, though, in all fairness. We publish a lot. True enough. Um, here's an international question. What does BB's victory uh, foretell for 2024? And it's a really good question. Um, I, I don't actually think it foretells anything other than giving Trump a talking point. But, you know, even there, Trump gave an interview to an, an author who works for Axios and is based in Israel uh, named Barack Ravid in which he um, was complaining bitterly about Bibi Netanyahu not doing enough for him in 2020. And I think, I think he used some colorful language to tell Netanyahu to engage in a sex act with himself. So um, I, uh, I don't know what that's going to look like going forward. Um, the chatter is that uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris are too unpopular to beat Trump. Do you think another Democrat uh, will emerge to challenge the president and, uh, and for the right to take on Trump? Not if Biden says he's running again. Not, not anyone real. No. There might be some gnats around his head, but... Yeah, I mean, I think you could always, you could always see somebody launch some kind of a, a quixotic primary effort in New Hampshire, right, or in Iowa. But, but not comes. something so divisive as Ted Kennedy against Jimmy Carter I, in 1980. I, I just don't like think we're going to see that, and I don't know who would be strong enough to launch that. Will Trumpism continue after his death? Can it ever be mainstreamed? I mean, maybe. I don't, I don't know how long the span of his life is going to be. Um, but I think that, uh, I think at the moment, I think Trumpism is going to be here for a while. You know, you write, I think we're sort of coming to the end, if I'm not mistaken. But um, if somebody wants to flag me in an opposite direction, let me know right away. Okay, all right. well, we, we certainly love Maggie, and it's an honor to be here with her. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to ask yourself? <laughs> <clears throat> Why I didn't dress more warmly. Um, I, uh, um, Larry Hart was right. California is cold and damp. In it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that you've hit on, on the things that I'm, I'm interested in people understanding about this book. I mean, I guess I, I do 
I do hope that people will read it, and I really do hope that um, they will see it as building towards something, and that this period in New York was was so defining for him, and and then ultimately for the country, and that what you know, Ted Cruz once talked about New York values derisively with Trump on a debate stage, and he meant social liberalism, but actually the New York values that Trump exported were you know, cronyism and, and bossism. And, you know, it's not as, as if Washington is a pure place, but Trump just doesn't care about systems and doesn't think that they should apply to him. Is there one most common question that people ask you, have asked you on the book tour about Trump? Is there something people really want to know? Um, does he really believe that he won the election? And what do you think? I think at this point he probably does, um, but I think, you know, I, I write in the book, and it's very similar to information the House Select Committee has. He, you know, he seemed to know he lost right away, and then, or at least in the first few days afterward, um, and and then something changed, and he just went all in on this idea that he was not going to accept it. So, one of the things that I write about um, is his use of repetition, and he even talked about it with me. How aware, you know, he would talk about. He talked about, in our third interview, about why he uses repetition in print interviews. It was, it was fascinating listening to him describe his different interview tactics um, or resp you know, responses. And he was saying that basically that when he does an interview on television, he's much, it's a much different interview. He's much more careful in what he says, which I know is hard to imagine, but that he's not saying, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and he doesn't watch himself as much, uh, or he watches himself more. Whereas if he's giving an interview for a book or for a newspaper, he said, I use repetition to beat it into your beautiful brain. Do you understand that? And the, the terminology about my beautiful brain aside and, and beating it, um, that he was talking about repetition was really interesting and his awareness of it was interesting. Talking about New York, not only did your experience as a reporter in New York obviously color your understanding of Trump and your exposure to him there, but you basically covered the White House by living in New York, which is a rare thing to do. Richard Rovere wrote for The New Yorker about Washington for 30 years by living in Connecticut. Do you think it gave you a, a, a valuable perspective to not be in the bubble of the White House all the time every day? I do, because I think that everybody in, in, in the White House in D.C. tends to be, you know, like arrows pointing in the same direction, uh, and I think it just gave me... Uh, a little bit of a different frame. It was also very helpful as these investigations into him were unfolding and as, you know, his fixer, Michael Cohen, was seeing his, you know, hotel and apartment and, and office searched by the FBI, it was more helpful to be in New York. The, um, the White House press corps, Mike McCurry, when he was press secretary, used to say that they were like birds on a wire. They'd, if one went on the wire, pretty soon everyone's on the same wire going the same, the same direction, as you say. Um, and obviously, part of covering the White House, part of covering Washington journalism requires a certain pack of journalism. You just know getting away from it if the president does something on a given day. That's what everybody's going to write about. Um, but were there, were there other concrete ways that you were just, just as happy not to be in that little rabbit warren of a White House and stuck in the briefing room and all of that? Yeah, I mean, I think there be, it, it got so combative in that briefing room that it, it was really, it, it became sort of futile at not a certain point. Not a place point. for real exchange of meaningful no, information. No, and I mean, and to be clear, it's not that I think the briefing room is a great, you know, font of ideas, you know, uh, over the last 10 years, but um, but I think that, uh, I think it's been, I think it's been degrading over time, um, but uh, but I do think that, it was far more productive previously. I think this just, these just became screaming matches where um, everybody was, not, not the print reporters, but, but everybody was kind of a set piece. And uh, it was sort of pointless. I mean, the, the only other sort of all the birds on a wire thing that I was not happy about, and this, this was not about being in New York, this was just about how we all covered him. There was just too much of a belief that every tweet was newsworthy at first um, because DC reporters, no one in the world, had seen a president tweeting like this before. And it took a while, I think, to realize that everything didn't have to be covered as if it was a meaningful presidential statement because everything he was saying was not filled with meaning. So. You've said yourself that you felt a certain ambivalence about your own tweeting. Did you scale it back at a certain point? Did you try to... I did, and then I discovered that because the guy I covered was on Twitter, this wasn't really working. And so, um, 
so I, I went back. Um, just to have equal time, so to speak, or have a... <laughs> to know what he was saying, I mean, and to know what people were reacting to what he was saying. It, was not, it just wasn't feasible not being on. And, uh, of course, you know, it was fashionable to say 30 years ago when I was covering the White House that it was a 24-7 news cycle. That isn't really true. For 24 hours a day, CNN ran packages of news that had been edited at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But now it really is. I mean, somebody can tweet something at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 2 in the morning, whatever. I mean, did you ever really, were you ever, did you ever feel you were really off duty when you were covering Donald Trump? I didn't, but in fairness, none of my colleagues were. I mean, we were really all on duty all the time. It was, it was, it was a day without end. It reminded me at various points, and this is going to sound like I'm saying it was benign, and that's not what I'm saying, but it reminded me of when you have a newborn, and it's like one long day. That's what this was like. It was one long day over the course of six months, and then you'd get a break, and then you'd start again. You have three children. They're teenagers now, mostly, I guess. Um, what do they think of Donald Trump? I'm not going to get into that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess what I mean is they've shared you with him, but are, are they... They don't like... They didn't like that. Yeah. This was really, this was really hard on them. I'm sure it, it, it would be very hard, yeah. Um, well, only I'm taking the privilege of the moderator who's a little cold to say that maybe we should... Um, but but I, I want to ask you one last thing, Maggie, which is you, without giving away the ending of your book, but you do write that um, people are constantly searching for the, the, the er text, the meaning of Donald Trump. What's he really doing? What's he really up to? And, and you write that he's ultimately opaque, permitting people to read meaning into every action, no matter how empty they may be. And it's sort of your last word on the subject, but is, 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 that, is that all there is to a fire? Pretty much. It's just that, you know, a fire can burn really fast and it can, it can consume a lot and take it with it. Um, you know, I, I think that I write in the book about a, a, a White House official saying to me when I asked at one point why Trump was torturing Jeff Sessions the way he was, which he did for two years because Jeff Sessions committed the ultimate sin of recusing himself from an investigation into Donald Trump. Um, why is he doing this? And the person said, because he can. And I think so much of what he does is just because he can. Well, there was all this speculation that taking the office would make him more presidential. Don't you quote him at one point as saying, I'm president, so what I'm doing is presidential? Yes, I mean, he like said that constantly. You know why it's presidential? Because I'm the president. He would say that all the time. I think there's another point that you, you asked somebody why he finally did run in 2016 after flirting with it for so long, and what was the answer? Um, I'm he's so, crazier. Oh, yes. He's, no, he's, I'm sorry. It took me a minute to remember. Uh, he's gotten crazier, was what they said. Yeah. And, 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 and they said it with no hesitation. I mean, it was, it, it, they meant it, and they felt like he had, you know, devolved in some way, and that that's why we got there. Have you gone back to ask that person what they think about 2024? Don't think I would get an honest answer from this particular person. person. Well, uh, on behalf of myself and Skirball and Writer's Block, I, I, I really think we're incredibly lucky to have had Maggie here tonight. And thank you all for coming out and, uh, on a November evening. And thanks to Maggie for being here. Thank you so much, Todd.